to the next plenary talk. That will be by Professor Gerhard Frey from the Institute for Experimental Mathematics at the University of Essen, Germany. And he is well known uh, for his contributions to number theory, especially elliptic curves over number fields and its application to cryptography. And so he's going to talk on Galois representations and data security. Thank you very much. And I first would like to thank you very, very much for the invitation to come to this wonderful place where even dreams are inspiring. And in fact, I was here before, long, long ago, 1984. And in some popular books, you can read that at the same time I gave a talk in Oberwolfach. So definitely this is not possible. But it is true that I gave a talk about elliptic curves here. And uh, I will give a, a talk about elliptic curves again. But in 84, this was really pure mathematics. Now, this is applied mathematics. Uh, but it's the same. The methods are exactly the same, only the outcome and the emphasis is a little bit different. And uh, you will see that what we are uh, talking about in this lecture is a little bit different from everything we have heard in this conference till now. For it is really algebra discrete mathematics and we don't deal with the real world like physicists seem to do, but we deal with a virtual world. But nevertheless, the impact of our, to our real life is very great. So what we want to do is we want co to communicate. So we want to exchange keys. We want to sign documents. We want to make documents authentic. And we want to maybe encrypt and decrypt. And all this we want to do in a environment which is totally public and to my opinion every channel and communication is in public nowadays. You can listen to everything if you want. So the method to do this is public key. And by the way, public key is about just half the age of the institute here. It's 25 years that it exists. Nevertheless, it is already a rather ripe uh, 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 theory, maybe an engineering theory, but uh, the theory in computer science too, and a theory in mathematics. If you take as basic for the crypto systems you use clean mathematical objects, which have a well understood mathematical background, and so uh, sometimes people say we should not take complicated theories. We should take something very simple when uh, no one can attack us for it. It's so simple. I think the contrary is true. If a theory is not simple, has a lot of background, many people have thought about it, Well, it's much easier to test in the very beginning whether you are in danger or you are not in danger. So I think uh, the so-called discrete logarithm systems are very well understood. What is such a system? I will spend, uh, let's say, the two, uh, first third of the lecture to explain a little bit what the objects are we are dealing with. And then I will say how number theory, how arithmetical geometry can help to deal with them. So what, what would we need? We, it's, it's very simple. We need a finite subset of a natural numbers. Finite means that a computer can understand it, so the number should be not too large. And we need a, something like an addition, an associative uh, map from A cross A to A. Uh, and we want to have uh, one functional uh, uh, equation to sign and to have key exchange. Now, uh, in fact, what we uh, do is we take an element, and then we do the addition n times. And then this is e is exponential so to say, in, uh, and when we just have a function depending on n and natural numbers and elements in A, and it satisfies the usual functional equations uh, with respect to uh, 
addition of arguments. It's bilinear, so to say. If we have such a thing, then we can do key exchange. And now this is very standard, but might be, maybe some of you don't, uh, didn't see this before. So I've written it very shortly here. Uh, that's the first fundamental thing in cryptography, public key cryptography. Two people want to communicate. Uh, so we uh, use uh, cryptography such that no one else can understand it. The usual symmetric cry cryptography just change the alphabet by a permutation. Only thing is both parties have to know this permutation. And so how can you transmit this permutation to the two parties? So this is the key exchange. And you do it in public. You just, we, we know our system, everything is publicly known. Then everyone in the system chooses one number. And this number is secret, should be a random number, and never goes to any authority. It stays with the one person. OK, and then you send not this number, but you send this number times, let's say, a basic element 1 in your set A. That's a certain element in the natural numbers. So the first party sends e of n1, uh, 1. The second party sends e of n2, 1. Then you compute e of n1, y2, if you are number 1, or e of n2, y1, if you are number 2. And then by a miracle, it turns out that you have computed the same numbers. And no one, what is publicly known, is the system. It is the yi, but not the ni. And so you have it changed. Your key now, uh, in fact, uh, this is not a secure protocol. Uh, of course, uh, you see, the security depends on the difficulty to compute ni from the knowledge of yi. So this is the mathematical part. But then there are very bad guys between which do some interfering and so on and so on. So you have to refine this protocol by the principle that's what you have to do. OK. So you see, it is essential to find such a plus which is kind of one-way function. You have to be able to compute it, the composition, very, very fast. And then it should be very difficult to to the inverse function. That's the whole game. So all the, all the systems in use today use groups. It's not necessary from a definition, but they use finite groups. And uh, since we assume that we can compute the group order, we have to uh, take the group order to be a prime. Uh, otherwise, you use the China's remainder theorem or periodic expansion to reduce it to this case. OK, and then as composition, you take just exponentiation of a given publicly known element, a generator of your group G. OK, this is your function. Now, what does it mean, security? And I only speak about the mathematical security. There is a very nice function which measures this security. This is a mixture between a polynomial and an exponential function. Put in, in this function L, uh, P, alpha, forget the C, uh, put in alpha equal to 0. Then you have E power log log P. And this is log P. And this is just the bit size. The measure is always the bit size of our security parameter P. Take alpha equal to uh, 1. When you have e power log p, and this is p, and so the size is p, and this is exponential in log p. So the function is very large if alpha is equal to 1, and very small if alpha is equal to 0. And this alpha is a measure for security. Okay. So alpha equal to 1, exponential, alpha equal to 0, polynomial complexity. And in many cases, you are between. And when you say you have a sub-exponential security. OK. Let me give three basic examples. First, take z mod pz with a natural numeration. 
So you just embed Z mod PZ in a natural way uh, in, into Z. Uh, you take the additive structure. So what does it mean to compute? You have a given A and a given B, and you want to know an N such that B is equal to N times A. How do you compute it? You use the Euclidean algorithm. And you do it in polynomial time, polynomial in the bits. So alpha, we are now in the polynomial security. Very, very bad. OK, second example. Take a finite field, take the multiplicative group, assume that you have a piece of those unity inside of this field, and then just take the image of Z mod PZ inside of this field by taking an L generator to a piece of, of unity. Now, the problem is you have given two roots of unity, zeta and zeta prime. And you have to compute a k such that zeta power k is equal to zeta prime. So this is really a logarithm, it's a classical discrete logarithm. Uh, one hoped in the beginning, and one could think, if one look at it naively, that it is much more difficult than the additive structure, and in fact it is. Uh, and, uh, but it is not as difficult as one would hope. It is really sub-exponential with alpha equal to one half and sometimes even alpha equal to one third. So it is weaker, but if you go up high enough, uh, you have a secure, uh, with, with uh, uh, Q, you have, uh, Q is the number of elements in your finite field, you have a secure system, at least nowadays. But the bad thing is, with sub-exponential, if you want to have double security, then it is not enough to take one bit more, but you nearly have to double the bit size. So this is because if for a very large uh, parameter, the sub-exponential function becomes more and more polynomial. OK, so sub-exponential systems are OK, but not the best. The best thing we can do is uh, take an elliptic curve and take points of order p in the group of rational points of an elliptic curve over a finite field. Then the only attacks we know are the generic ones, which can be applied to all groups and the complexity is exponential. And this means, uh, there's a factor of one half uh, in the constant, so this means if you want to double the security, you just have to add two more bits. And so if you make, a, 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 at, at the state of art nowadays, if you compare systems, you need, let's say, 160 bit if you, uh, for P, if you have an elliptic curve, you need 2048 bits if you have a multiplicative group. And by the way, it's the same security as you need when you have RSA. And soon, you will have to use 4,000 bits. That's clear. So elliptic curves are quite nice, have a good performance, and one should use it. But I have written here random elliptic curves. And this means some elliptic curves are weak. And in the most of the talk, in the last part of the talk, I will speak why uh, about the, uh, the reason why some of the elliptic curves are weak. And this is number theory in the nicest appearance we have today. OK. So what is the reason that people doing algebraic geometry, arithmetic geometry, number theory, are in the game. The reason is that all systems we use today in this DL game have one principle of construction. You take a nice ring O, let's say finitely generated algebra over a Euclidean ring, so you can compute in this algebra, and you take ideals, invertible ideals, they form a group under multiplication. This is very easily done, multiplication of ideals. It's a very easy process. OK. But when you have a huge group, so you divide out principal ideals. And what you get 
is the Picard group of your ring O. And all systems are Picard groups of such rings O. <coughs> what you can use for rings are, for instance, orders in number fields. And we are proposed and sometimes even implemented. Uh, the nice thing is that you have the geometry of numbers. And so you, uh, you see the problem is if you multiply two classes of ideals, what are you doing? You take an ideal in the first class, an ideal in the second class, you multiply the ideals, and then you take the class of this product ideal. But then you have to describe it again, so you have to find a nice ideal in this ideal class again. And this means a small one, and this is exactly the reduction theory in every ideal class, this is a theorem of Minkowski, you find an ideal of small norm, and this is constructive. So with number theory, if you go to algebraic geometry, when you have the same theorem, and no, it only has a different name, it's now called the theorem of riemann roch which tells you that in every uh, uh, ideal class of a, of a, let's say, polynomial order, you find an ideal of small degree. So these are the tools, and this makes it possible to compute, and I will uh, restrict myself here to geometric systems, because one can show that all uh, systems coming from number theory, again, have only sub-exponential security. Geometric systems. You just take a ring of holomorphic functions of an affine curve. But if you do this, then intrinsically behind, there is a projective curve, just the projective closure of a affine curve you have. And this projective curve has a close relation to abelian varieties via its Jacobian. And now it's easy to see that in many cases, you have coming from the cover map, from uh, the curve to the projective line, you have a nice description of this curve, and you have a close relation between the Jacobian of the curve and the points on the Jacobian of the curve and the ideal class group of your order. In many cases, it's always a surjective mapping, but in many cases, it's an isomorphism. Typically, it's an isomorphism, for instance, if you have hyperelliptic curves. And hyperelliptic curves are curves with equation y squared plus hx times y is equal to a polynomial of degree 2g plus 1 8x. In this case, you have that the ideal class group of k, x, y, bottle of this relation, is in a canonical way isomorphic to the divisor class group of divisors of degree 0, which means of the points of the Jacobian. Why is this important to have these two things? Now, if you do want to do computations, you cannot use abelian varieties, for it's much too complicated to add in abelian varieties. So you use curves and the theorem of Riemann Roch for ideals, for positive divisors. If you want to have structural theorems, then uh, a pick of rings, uh, you cannot say much about it. But you can say a lot about structural properties of abelian varieties. And so you play the game, whatever is good for you, you take. Uh, that's quite nice, but we have an additional possibility to attack the system. Uh, just let me recall, we began with an abstract A. When we said this A should be a group, and uh, I did not say it, but I mentioned it, I think I mentioned it shortly, adding the word group to your structure already means that you lose half of your bit size of security, just by saying group. And this comes from random walks in group and the birthday paradox. You just walk around with two paths and they meet, expectedly after something like square root of the order of steps. OK, so adding a structure always means more attacks. OK, now we have added the structure Jacobian variety, or peak of a ring. And 
immediately we have a new possibility to attack our system. This is the so-called index calculus attack. What is the principle? You see, we have uh, ideals, ideal classes in a ring. Then we have very special ideals, namely prime ideals. And every ideal is built up by powers of prime ideals. And then there are small prime ideals, such with small degree or small norm. And then the idea is just take not too many of these small prime ideals and try to write any ideal as a product of small prime ideals with small exponents. And then look for relations amongst these small prime ideals, and this is index calculus, and it works. And it works typically sub-exponentially. And this, means, this is the reason why you should not use orders in number theory. In function theory, a nice thing happens. The sub-exponentiality is measured by the size of your group. In geometry, this is q power g, g equal to the genus of a curve, by theorem of hasse weyl OK, now you cannot separate in this, in this uh, attack q and g. It is, all this comes together. This means for small genus, the attack does not work. And it's now a very strange phenomenon that you have a very narrow window where you can do your cryptography. It's just Jacobians of curves of genus 1, 2, and 3. And all other systems are not as secure as they should be. OK, that's nice for us, for we cannot deal with curves of higher genus. So it's good that we only have to care about curves of genus 1, 2, and 3. So these are the objects. Now I have to come to the tools. The tools uh, are coming from different areas, but one very essential one is Galois theory. And this is no wonder, for we are dealing with torsion points of abelian varieties. And we all know that the Galois action on torsion points of abelian varieties gives representations which are very, very strong. And so it is quite natural to use this representation theory. So in principle, we only would, we would be happy to know everything about the Frobenius. This is the generator of a Galois group of finite field. But it turns out that we have to lift to periodic fields from finite fields. This means we have to go to the Galois group of a local field, a periodic field, and there we find the Galois group of a finite field as a quotient, a natural quotient, belonging to the maximum unramified extension. But even worse, sometimes we have to go to the whole feature of number theory, we have to go to a global field. And then our local Galois groups just are decomposition groups inside of a global Galois group. So this is the hierarchy of the three levels of Galois groups which occur. Now let me, I want to give two or three applications. I go first to a positive one, namely point counting. You see, if you believe that discrete log systems should be based on Jacobians of curves or on Picard groups of, uh, of, 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 of uh, uh, rings of holomorphic functions, then we have a serious problem. We have to count the number of points on curves over finite fields. Now, of course, you see that's trivial from a mathematical point of view. You just take x, uh, we have an equation x and y, you take x and you try whether uh, there is a y satisfying this equation. The only bad thing is the size of the, the, of, of, of the domains you have to do this is something like 10 power 60. And then it's very difficult to use one, uh, the fingers. You, know, you cannot move them fast enough. So it's out of range to do naive counting. What you do is you remember that, uh, yeah, uh, first of all, uh, we say, OK, I try a curve. Then in many cases, this curve is not good. There is not a 
very, very large prime dividing this order. So first you say, have I a chance? And th these are nice theorems from analytic number theory, which tell you that with a certain probability, a high order is occurring with last group. So this is like Cohen-Lenstra heuristics, or uh, density theorems coming from analytic number theory. You use it, and you see you really have a chance. For instance, for elliptic curves, if you take random elliptic curves, then every 50 uh, of these curves, so you need 50 trials, and you have, then you have a good one. If you take curves of genus uh, uh, 2, I think one needs something like 1,000 trials. And genus 3 is more than 10 or 20,000 trials. So you have a good chance, but you have to try quite often. So you have to be able to count the number rather rapidly. Otherwise, uh, you see, if you, if you have 50, you, you, you need two years to count, and you have to do 50 trials, then it's definitely too long. How can you count on curves rapidly? Well, you just compute L-series. And how do you compute L-series? You compute the action of a forbidden of torsion elements, and then you get the characteristic polynomial of this Frobenius. You know that uh, you can use different orders, and you always get the same polynomial modulo the orders. You use the Chinese remainder theorem, and you put it together. When you have the L series of your curve, you plug in with a, with a polynomial of small degree, degree 2g, with integers, not too big integers. And when you plug in t equal to 1, and out comes the class group's order. So you have to compute the L-series. How can you compute the L-series? Now, this is really a triumph of our uh, uh, theories. You have to use cohomology. You can use the Ram cohomology, uh, cohomology maybe you begin with etal cohomology, but then you even have to go to crystalline cohomology more abstractly. I will come to this in a moment. You have to use rigid cohomology with crystalline coefficients. That's the most horrible thing which exists. But you have to use it to do cryptography. OK. I said already, determine L series and then use Lefschetz fixed point formula. And I indicated already a first method to do this, namely just uh, take Tate modules, these are projective limits of the points of order L, L squared, L3, and so on, and compute what the Frobenius is doing on these Tate modules. And you do it for small Ls and modulo some small powers, and you put it together with the China's remainder theorem. So please don't be confused. I'm interested in points of order P. P is very large. But I'm looking at the action of a Frobenius on torsion points of very small order. And then I put it together with the Chinese remainder theorem. So that's much easier than to count points. Just look, what is the Frobenius doing on points of small order? Of course, they are not defined over your ground field in general. But uh, they are polynomials. Describing them, and you have to go into this polynomial and see what the Frobenius is doing. It's really Galois theory. OK, this is Scove's algorithm. And uh, in fact, uh, Scove developed this long ago. And this was his PhD thesis. And uh, I think Lenstra was his supervisor. But Lenstra said, I cannot accept it. No one is interested in counting points. So he said, OK, I see this is t uh, a method to uh, take the square root out of elements and then people were interested at that time. Now, of course, the situation is totally uh, uh, going to the uh, uh, inverse situation. No one cares about uh, uh, taking the square root of elements, but everyone wants to count points. So this is Kof algorithm, which works for any genus in polynomial time, only it does not work. This means it has polynomial complexity, but the powers occurring are too large in this polynomial. OK, you have to uh, use some more tricks. 
and this is due to Atkins, Elkins, Morin, and so on and so on. And in the end, you have a result that it is no problem nowadays to count points on random elliptic curves in a cryptographically interesting range by l arctic methods. But if you go to higher genus, the methods don't work till now. There are some beginnings of a theory due to Gautry and Harley and others, uh, but it does not work good enough till now. So you go to p adic methods. If L does not work, you go to P. And P always means you are in the same characteristic as uh, uh, P is the characteristic of a ground field. L is always different from a characteristic. OK, p adic methods, uh, you uh, try to compute uh, the Frobelius automorphism. You cannot do this over a finite field, so you lift the situation to a p-adic field. And then sometimes it's much better to do this for you can use p-adic analysis. The only problem is that the lifting of the Frobelius has to be done in two ways. One is Galois theoretically, I said this already is no problem. The other one is as endomorphisms of abelian varieties. And this is very difficult, and in many cases it cannot be done. There are the so-called canonical lifts, and they only exist if you have ordinary abelian varieties. And then it's a hard problem. Okay, nevertheless, you do this. Now, before doing this, I should say that all these periodic methods have a complexity with, which is very bad in P, but very good in the extension degree of a field. The field is Q equal P power N. So N is going inside very tably in the complexity. P is very bad. OK, you can apply this method for small p. P equal to 2, 3, 5, 7, and then it's already the end. By the way, I should say this here. What is the challenge, for instance? The challenge is compute the Artin uh, Schreier matrix for a curve, characteristic P, in order to determine, for instance, the P rank or the characteristic polynomial of Cartier operators and such things. If you can do this fast, you get a good uh, uh, deal of information if P is not too small. But it seems to be very hard to nowadays. OK. So you do these canonical liftings. This was begun by Sato in a beautiful work two years ago. And it is now brought to perfection by Mestre using the so-called AGM method, arithmetic geometrical mean. And so you can do this in milliseconds in characteristic two, at least for elliptic curves and for curves of genus two, two. So it works, but it works only for very small characteristic. Genus three seems to be a problem till now. And uh, yeah, it's a difficult method. It's fast, efficient, but difficult. So much easier to understand and much easier to handle is crystalline cohomology. What you are doing is not lifting your curve with the endomorphism, the Frobenius endomorphism. You just take any lift, so you have no chance to find the Frobenius in characteristic zero and operating on this curve. But you go to the completion, the ring of power series, and there you have no problem to have a Frobenius operating just by uh, continuous uh, by, by the con continuity. So it's very easy. It's a power series in one variable, and of course you have uh, you, you, you have operation of a Frobenius. And then you take the Deram cohomology of this power series ring. Now you have to be a little bit careful. You have to take uh, very fast converging power series, and this is monsky waschnitzers theory, and it works perfect. So this is monsky waschnitzer cohomology. You, this was developed in the 60s and 70s of the last century. It's very old, but now you can use it really to, to it's implemented and it works. Everything I'm telling here is implemented and is used in practice. There's no speculation. Uh, it's really used. So this is uh, monsky waschnitzer And then you can go really to the beginnings of periodic analysis. This is the work of Twerk about differential equations in characteristic P. 
And one of the great outcomes of his theory was his proof about the rationality of zeta functions of varieties. And using just the trace formula he has proved in this paper, uh, Lauders and Van can compute again the points mod p. But there is one problem open, namely what is happening if you have curves of genus 2 and 3 and if you have a large characteristic, and we would like to have this for working over prime field instead of fields of for two power something has advantages. Okay, so this is a problem to find the number of points on curves of genus two and three over large prime fields. And the only method we know till today is complex multiplication. And here you do the following. You do not fix a field and then look for curves, but you fix a curve in characteristic zero, and then your one-dimensional variety you are walking is spectrum of z. So you choose your primes. And so you construct a curve over a number field, such that the ring of endomorphism has complex multiplication. You have class field theory, theory of Taniyama Shibura, or class field theory of imaginary quadratic fields in the easiest case. And this tells you what is the Frobenius. It's just given by the main theorem of class field theory, you can compute the Frobenius by just computing traces of elements belonging to prime ideas with a special behavior. And this is done very easily. So you compute first the order of your Jacobian modulo p. And if you have a good p, then you do all effort to, con to compute the equation. So first you compute the order, and then the equation. OK. For example, if you have elliptic curves, then you just do classical class field theory of imaginary quadratic fields. And you have a jade variant. Everything is very, very easy. And we have a table on our web page where you can find, I think, more than 5 million of elliptic curves uh, where we have computed the order. And so no one can patent them. All elliptic curves which can be computed are on, the, on our website if they have complex multiplication. You are welcome to take them. Okay. If you go to genus 2, things become a little bit more difficult for the class field theories now over CM fields of degree 4. So these are imaginary quadratic extension fields of real fields of uh, degree 2. Invariant theory is a little bit more complicated. You have three invariants instead of one, the chain variant. But there is a nice theory of Mestre, and you use it. And here I have one example uh, computed by a student of mine, Annegret Weng, for genus 2. You have a field. You have these polynomials are uh, the, uh, the class polynomials of the invariant. So there are polynomials uh, defined, uh, monic polynomials defined over Z. This gives all the information you need to find the curve equation. And then you look for uh, a, a certain prime. You see this prime has a good property. You can compute the order of a Jacobian, which is this long number. It's eight times a prime with 67 digits. And you have this with a, 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 the equation of the curve is given. It seems to be horrible, but these are not long numbers for a computer. And uh, the prime p, you see, uh, I can write with a larger font than the order because I have genus 2. That's the great, uh, the great advantage. If I have high genus, then the order of a Jacobian is large, uh, uh, even if a ground field is smaller than the elliptic curves. Things become even more complicated if you go to genus 3. But never <coughs> one of the main complications is that Curves of genus 2 are always hyperelliptic. Curves of genus 3 are mostly not hyperelliptic. It's hard to find hyperelliptic curves of genus 3. But here is an example, again, computed by Anne Kret Weng. And you see now the p I use is very small. And nevertheless, I have, again, uh, 60 decimal digits as a prime. So it's perfect for cryptography. 
this curve. So, this was the good side of Galois theory. Now let me come to the bad side. I use it to uh, attack my uh, system and to do this I use duality. I have an abelian variety and an abelian variety over any field has a duality theory. So let me very shortly explain how it works. Uh, you have to distinguish two cases. Uh, the order of a group you are looking for is equal to the characteristic of a ground of a residue field or is not equal to. Now, the first case is very, very silly, but some people used it. So we had to prove that it does not work. And the reason is a very old theorem, duality uh, in characteristic P uh, between differentials and torsion points on the Jacobian. And the map is given very easily. You just you have a point of order p, so you, it has a divisor. p times the divisor is a function. And now you take the uh, holomorphic function df divided by f. This is holomorphic because we are in characteristic p. And uh, then you take this, this function is determined by its first co coefficients in some uh, expansion at some point. You compute this point, and you have an isomorphism from the points of order p of a Jacobian into a vector space of a finite field. And this, comes, this is the first example uh, you use the Euclidean algorithm to uh, break the system completely. The only thing we have to do is to evaluate a function at a point. Now, this seems to be very easy. But the function has a degree something like 10 power 60. So you will not be able to write it down. So this is, in the moment, an open problem. Let's go to the next case, which is much more complicated, the Kummer case. Here we have our order we are interested in is prime to the characteristic of the ground field. And then we really have to use uh, cohomology in order to get a pairing using the, pa the veil pairing, but it's not the veil pairing. We use the veil pairing in cohomology to get a pairing between the rational points of the abelian variety divided by p times the rational points cross h1 in the cohomology points of order p, and it goes to h2 gk mu p. And now this is really very nice, because this group h2 h gk mu p is famous. It's the power group, elements of order p of a power group of a field. But we have this pairing. Now, of course, if the pairing has not good properties, you cannot use it. But it's a famous theorem of Tate, again proved in the 60s, that if you restrict yourself to k to be an elliptic field, then this pairing is not degenerate. Very beautiful theorem. So if we can compute this pairing, then we have, have transferred the discrete log on the Jacobian to the discrete log in a power group. And if we can compute in the power group, and if we, can, uh, if we can compute with pairing, we have a new problem which maybe is easier. OK, how can we compute? In general, it will, will be very hard. So we have to assume that we have the piece of unity inside of our elliptic field or inside of a residue field. It's the same because of Hans's lemma. And then you do a little bit of uh, Galois cohomology, uh, uh, you uh, have a much easier description of a pairing. And uh, the only bad thing is you have added a special thing, namely the roots of unity. Now you have an abelian variety with points of order p and the p root of unity inside of a field. And this is very rare. I've written down what it means for elliptic curve. It just means that the trace of a Frobenius is equal to 2 mod p. And there are only very few such curves. So it's a sharp condition that you can avoid this very easily. Anyway, let's go further. We have this pairing. Now we have to compute it. And we can compute it in the case that we have not an arbitrary uh, abelian variety, but a Jacobian. For then, we use a version of Lichtenbaum of this pairing, who proved this in order to prove uh, uh, to, to correct the proof of Roquette. 
uh, and this uh, is just the following. You have a description of the pairing. Uh, yeah, now you can restrict yourself to two points of order P, and you pair them just by taking the, uh, the, the, the function uh, corresponding to the device P times the first point or the second point, and then you plug in the first point. And then you get an element in uh, uh, the, power, uh, the, uh, the power cube, and the power cube you can describe uh, by uh, cyclic algebras, and so it's a class in the norm class group, and so you have an explicit description. If you can, again, evaluate a function of very high degree at a point, can you do this? Yeah, there's a trick due to Victor Biller for elliptic curves, and it is the background is more generally the theory of Mumford theta groups. Now again, this is a fancy object. It just means that Mumford gave a method to construct extensions of abelian varieties with multiplicative groups or with additive groups, just by using co-cycles. So you take the direct product, let's say, of GM, multiplicative group, and abelian variety, and then the addition is twisted by a co-cycle. So in the abelian variety, you add as usual. But in the multiplicative group, you multiply the, argu the, the, the argument, but you change it by a co-cycle, this product. And for this co-cycle, you just use a point of order P, for instance. And if you do this, then you see, I take the, uh, you begin with a point P. Let's see, P, uh, P1 you want to plug in add one in your group, then you do this addition p times, then the first component becomes zero, and in the last component you have evaluated your point, the function, which defines the co-cycle, at the point p. So this is now a group operation. And in groups, you can do exponentiation very fast. That's the background of the whole DL systems, by adding and doubling doubling, and you need something like two times log p steps. So you can do this really fast. And so you can reduce the discrete log on a billion varieties in polynomial time to power groups and more uh, down to earth to the discrete log in the multiplicative group of a field which you obtain by adjoining p suit of unity. So if we are downstairs already, you have weakened your system, your system considerably. Why? Now this is because uh, the discrete log in the multiplicative group of fields is only sub-exponential. Now this is a known result, but I want to give you in the last three minutes a structural background. This is namely why we can compute in power groups. And for me, this is a new, a fascinating facet of the whole theory. Now, power groups and computing in power groups, no one did it before. Computing in power groups becomes essential for the cryptography. How can you compute in power groups? First of all, the easiest elements, uh, power groups are uh, classes of uh, central symbol algebras. And the easiest such algebras are like the quaternion, quaternion algebras are cyclic algebras. Okay, they are given by a generator of a cyclic extension and an element in the uh, norm class group. Uh, if you are, have a local field, then local class field theory tells you that there is an invariant associated to every cyclic algebra and it can be computed if your cyclic algebra is given by a Frobenius and a, an element in the second part, by the value, periodic value of this element in the second part. So if you can compute the invariant, you can compute inside of power groups. Only bad thing is if you look close at it, then you see this computation of invariants, which we all learn in local class theory is easy, is in fact exactly the computation of a discrete log. So you come back. 
You cannot get by local. Uh, so what we did, we had a curve over finite field. We lifted it to a periodic field. We came to power groups, local power groups. We come back to the discrete log of a field. Finite field or periodic field, it's the same. OK, but when we go to global fields, we have a very famous sequence. We have now our local field as one amongst many completions. And we have the exact sequence that the global power group is mapped by restriction maps to the lo all local power groups. And that the kernel, that it is just uh, characterized as kernel uh, of, if you take the sum over all invariants. And the co-kernel of the sum invariants is uh, Z mod PZ. So you have a possibility to go from local, one local uh, uh, element in the Brouwer group to a global one by just putting in other uh, coordinates. So you hope that you can lift your local algebra to a global one and then compute the invariance that all place is different from the one you are interested in. By the sum relation, you have done it when at the one place. And you remember, this is exactly what you usually do if you, uh, if you uh, deal with quadratic forms. They are difficult in characteristic two. So you compute all, all things outside of characteristic two, and then by Hilbert sum relation also you get the result at characteristic two. Okay, this is the idea. It does not work like that. But what you uh, can do is an index calculus, uh, calculus approach again. And what you need is not how cyclic extensions are really given. You need only that they exist and a splitting uh, a law. And this is exactly what glass, what glass field theory does. Glass field theory tells you there is an extension cyclically of some degree and prime split according to the following law. So you use this glass field theory and you can show that the complexity of a discrete logarithm in finite fields is sub-exponential. Just by computing in power groups and using this local global theory. Okay, this result was proved before. But there are many, many complicated and different methods. Keyword function, uh, number field C, function field C. We have only one method, and glass field theory gives it all the cases at once. And we did this lifting in a rather naive way. We means Kim Nguyen in a thesis uh, in Essen in a rather naive way. And you can do this lifting maybe much more refined, and then you get more information. So there is more information in power groups than I have exploited till now. There's some hope for the future. So maybe if you celebrate your 60th anniversary, I can give you a better answer. Thank you very much. Genus 4 has the same complexity, but uh, much worse. Uh, uh,
INFAK